There's the mute button. Okay, welcome. Give me just a second. I was trying something different here, and I think I may have confused myself. Well, despite my best attempts to make it all smooth, I've not done it. There we go. That's what I'm supposed to do. Okay. Well, welcome. Today we're going to be talking about leading agile, and um. What I was trying to do here is go through and uh, take a lot of the conversations I have with uh, with the management of teams when I start working with them and uh, give everybody a view of what, what that kind of looks like. So this will be in two parts. This is part one. Um, and then next week we have, let's see, Jason Sweet is going to be talking to us about ChatGPT and TDD again. And then the week after that, we're going to be coming back and dealing with the second half of, of this. So that's our plan. And uh, let's see. Okay, so um, this is what we be. Hang on, let me mute everybody here to make sure nothing unexpected happens. So that's what we're going to be talking about, about today. Um, I do want to mention a few things. Um, I sent a... Uh, Oh, I, I know it was the uh, here a few a month or so ago. We did a I, I did a class on where we went through five business books and looked at what it meant to um, what they had to say about agile, even though they're not written about about agile. We had a small group of people. It was a lot of fun. It was paid class through Maven. Um, I'm going to run that class again. Usually, when I kick off a class like that, I like to have a few people on right away. Um, so if that interests you and you would be interested in the very, 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 very early bird pricing, send me an email. I'll make sure you're on the small list of people that I'll send it to to kind of kick things off. So if that's interesting, just hit reply to something I've sent you and I will make sure you're on that list. Uh, the Minty code, um, it should show up here in just a minute uh, or here we can paste it, paste it in just a second, in, in just a second. Okay, so let's get started. Like I said, this is next week, ChatGPT, what it can and can't do for TDD, which is going to be uh, a very interesting talk, I think. So we're going to start off talking about Percival Lowell. Uh, he lived from 1865 to 1916. And the question for you is, what is associated with Percival Lowell? So take a look at, at these three pictures. What do you think is associated with Percival Lowell? Is that, and that link is in the chat. And if you don't see it in the chat, you can also just go to minty.com and type that, type that in there. I think it may be showing you my slides with the green screen on it as, as we go, which wasn't my intention, but that's how it worked out. Okay, so we've got some votes for the radio telescope, which uh, has fallen down since I think I did this last time. Uh, the Clark Telescope and uh, one person voting for the Sphinx Observatory. So the, the correct answer is he actually was associated with the, actually, do I have a way to, oh, there we go. He was associated with the Clark Telescope, um, the Percival, uh, or the Lowell Observatory is named af after him. So that's, that's what his fame was as an astronomer. Um, also, his infamy comes as an astronomer. So this diagram is what he was most known for. He, uh, this was a picture of, was this Venus or Mars? I think this one was Venus. And he discovered canals on Venus and Mars. And he took pictures of these and was filming them. And as he was filming them, they did all kinds of, you know, he could see how they were growing and moving different places. And um, he was known for, now the, now the problem was the reason he was infamous for it is no one else was able to, to duplicate this. So for many, many years, so he died in 1916, for many, many years, people had no idea why he came up with this hoax that there were canals on, on Mars. Um, until a, uh, an amateur photographer started really looking at his, no, I'm sorry, an amateur astronomer who was a professional uh, eye doctor started really looking at his notes of what he was doing and how he had set up the telescope and things. And he replicated it, and he realized when you put the telescope in that particular configuration, it did something a little bit different than show you just Mars or Venus. It actually turned it into an ophthalmoscope, which lets you look at the back of your eye. So what he was actually drawing was this, it was the veins in the back of his eye. And as they grew and different things happened, he was charting all those things, which was, 
I, I don't know, it may have been a big breakthrough at the time if he had known what he was doing, but instead he said it was these uh, canals on Mars. And this wasn't discovered, I think it was 2014. So like 100 years after he had been saying this, everybody thought he was crazy, didn't know why, you'd come, you know, he seemed like the same person other than these canals he saw on Mars and, and Venus. Turns out he was just looking at the wrong thing, or he thought he was seeing one thing when he was really seeing something else. He was measuring all these canals on Mars. That's not what he was actually measuring. And so the question I want to put, pose to us is, what are we actually measuring on our teams? Is it possible that we're measuring the wrong things or the thing that we think we're measuring isn't really the thing that we're measuring? So question for you, what things do your teams measure? So you can vote for, do they measure story points, cycle time, return on investment, or defects? What are some of the things that your team measures? Astrid is saying the return on investment isn't measurable for our team. And there's a lot of things we try to measure that, or that we would like to measure that we can't, and so we use a proxy for it. So if we're measuring story points, oftentimes we may be using that as a proxy for whatever's valuable to, to the customer, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but we need to be very careful to make sure that it's really tied to what we see as being va valuable. Um, if we're measuring defects, that might be a proxy for the quality of, of our code. So the, like I said, that is not necessarily a bad thing, but we have to be very, very careful that we're not measuring something. It turns out we're drawing and measuring the veins in the back of our eyes when we really should be, when we, when we think we're measuring something else. Okay, so these are some of the things that, that uh, our teams, teams measure. So when we're looking for trying to figure out what to, what to work on, um, one of the big things, um, and give me a thumbs up if you heard this, we need to get more work done. Has anyone ever been on a team where kind of the driving thing is we need to get more, more work done? And, and that's what's, what's driving things. So kind of the coal area of that is that we have this idea that if we work on fewer things at a time, fewer things will get done. And think about that for just a second. So we have this idea that if we work on fewer things at a time, fewer things will get, will get done. So of those statements we just talked about, what does your organization believe? Like, which do you think is a stronger belief in your organization? That if we don't start more work, we won't get enough done, or if we start too much work, we'll get less done. What is the strongest belief in your organization? Which of these? That if we don't start more work, we'll get enough done. And let's think of belief in terms of how it drives actual behavior. Because sometimes what people, what an organization says they believe and what they actually do are not necessarily the same thing. So it looks like most of us are saying that your organization believes if we start too much, we'll get, le we'll get less done, which is probably correct for, you know, that, that probably is actually defines what, what will happen. My experience has been that most organizations do not behave like this. They tend to think, they tend to act as if in a way that they feel if they don't start more work, they won't get enough done. And do like I say, not as I do. Yes, yes. Okay, so that brings, that leads us to this type of, of thing. So if we've got management and leadership in the organization feeling that if we don't start enough work, we won't get as much enough done, it, it leads to this, I like this little meme, start all the things. So let's let's start everything, right? Start all the things. So we end up with a situation like this, where we've got four projects we're working on, and we've decided that we're going to start everyone at the beginning of the year, and we're going to work through, and then they should all finish at, at the end of the year. We're going to work on all of them simultaneously at the same time. So the projected value of this, let's say each project is going to be worth 100000 It's going to produce $100,000 worth of uh, return on investment each year. So at the end of year one here, we've actually achieved nothing, right? The, the amount that we've earned from these four projects is zero because all of them completed at the, at the end of the year. So there's been no return on investment yet. We've done some great things. And ideally, we started at the end of the year and then finished at, at the end of the year on all, all of these things. And then when we get into the next year, we'll earn that $100,000 per year on all of them. So at the end of year two, we'll have made $400,000. End of year one, nothing. End of year two, we'll made $400,000. 
So we've started all these things. We wanted to get them all started at the same time because that's what we were most concerned about not getting enough, enough done. Well, here's a different approach. In that, play, in that approach, we had four things working at the same time. So our whip was, was four. In this case, we're gonna have a whip of two. So we're going to only allow ourselves to work on two things at the same time and finish them and then start on, on the next thing. So all of our resources um, are going to be working on delivering these, these two things. In this case, though, instead of waiting till the end of year one before we can start getting a return on investment, we actually start getting a return on investment of $50,000, half a year, on the two projects that we finished before the end of the year. If, and this is assuming everything's equal, but in this case, we work half a year on these two projects, and then we got them to where they're developing a return on investment. These other projects, we ended up finishing at the end of the year like we did in the first scenario. So they don't earn anything until the end of the year, but we've got that extra $100,000 that we didn't have before. So if we look at year one and year two, we now have $500,000 at the end of year two instead of just the $400,000 that we've earned from it. And like I said, this type of graph of showing this is not something that I, I find for most organizations, this is not intuitively how they think about their projects. They don't start, it's, it's harder for organizations to really think in terms of what can I deliver sooner so I can start earning a return on investment versus how many things can I work on at, at the same time. So these are the charts that I usually like to go through with, with leadership and managers to say, are we thinking about the way we manage our projects in the right way? Because if I'm thinking more in terms of let's start 100 projects so they'll all be done at the end of the year, I'm probably wasting a lot of value. That $100,000 that appeared here, we're not going to be able to take advantage of that. So why might your organization be less inclined to finish two projects before starting on the other two? So if your organization would be more likely to say, we're going to start all four projects and finish them at the end of the year instead of saying, no, 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 we're going to limit what we work on. What would be the reasons that your organization might be less inclined to try to finish the two projects before starting on the next two? Is there anything that comes to mind? Customer engagements. Okay, so customer engagements as in you've got customers that want to see you working on something, which, which is legitimate, like saying we're not going to work on this for a while is kind of a hard thing. Less to brag about, okay. The optics of productivity, yes, that... Uh, that is a big one because if you're working on the two projects, you may have people that appear to be less busy because there's less things on their plate. Just to show executives we're working on something, um, shorter feedback times, a shiny new toy, dependencies between the projects, executives screaming from the mountaintops. So that actually is a very legitimate concern. And what I find in a lot of places is all of those four projects are really important to someone. And if you're in an organization that does not have the maturity to be able to prioritize which ones they want first, it's going to be very hard to make a decision about what to work on first and what to work on, on later. That is a leadership problem, right? That is a problem where the leadership and management has, and the organization as a whole has not matured to the point that they can actually identify in a way that everybody can agree on or at least be okay with, yes, X is more important than Y. A lot of times the reason that that is difficult for organizations is because they are very used to projects being promised on one day and never delivered till much, much later. Because of that, everybody wants their project being worked on right now because if it's something that won't be started until later, until something else is done, they have, and and their experience bears this out, they have reason to expect that it will take a lot longer, it'll be a lot longer be before, they, before they get it. Um, let's see what else you got. Not willing to make trade-offs when priority work comes up. That's that's a very good one. Very good point there. Uh, they want to uncover the issues earlier instead of waiting to start and finding out the issues. So that, that sounds like a very legitimate reason, right? We have things that are risky and we want to do them sooner. But I would suggest that that needs to still be part of the prioritization. If I'm getting ready to work on something and if I'm trying to decide what to work on next the decision of what risk I want to encounter sooner should be part of that. Because if we go back here and look at, let me go back a few. If we look at this, in that blue project right there, I am going to encounter the risk if I do these two projects sooner, I will encounter the risk a lot sooner by doing it that way than I will if I work on all four projects at the same time. The question is, can we actually have a conversation and decide which are the, what are the biggest risks on the project that has the greatest payoff and make a decision about what we want to do first. 
So this all comes down to, to priority. Okay, so with the idea that we can get value, if we finish two projects, we get to start getting value from them. Now we can change our meme to say, we want to finish some things, right? Let's, let's get something done so we can start earning a return on investment. So now we have an updated meme based on what we've just look, learned about uh, projects. Okay, so what if we do this though? Look at, look at this one. In this case, we're going to just put all of our efforts into finishing that one blue project first. And so we should finish it in a quarter of a year instead of four years. Well, now that project should earn $75,000 over the rest of the year. When we finish it, while it's starting to earn that $75,000, we can then start on that magenta project and we can deliver it in a quarter of a year. And then it will earn $50,000 first. So now we've created $150,000 of value that did not exist when we were working on everything at the same time. Now, this is very much an idealized situation. We may find there are there's a lower limit to how we can break, break things up. But in most organizations, if they're not thinking about this, the limit is probably way lower than the way they're actually doing their work. So now we update our meme again, right? Let's finish one of the things, right? Finish one of the things, and then we'll be able to start earning a return on investment from it. So we now, our meme guy with the pitchfork is, uh, is updated for what, what we've learned. Well, what about this? What if we were able to take that blue project and actually deliver half of it to where it's doing something valuable? We, we divide the work in a way that it's able to start earning a return on investment even before the entire project's done. And then we deliver the next half of the project. Well, now we've gone from where we were working on everything at the same time and we had zero dollars of return at the end of the year. We've now got $175,000 at the end of the year. So now we'll update our meme again and say, okay, so finish part of one of the things, right? Now that's our rallying cry to get something done and get the return on investment from it. And the point of walking through this is if your organization is not thinking in terms of how do I deliver something and start earning back what I've invested in, you're probably not going to make decisions that give you a good return on investment because our natural inclination in most organizations is to move toward working on lots of things at the same time, whether it's because somebody mentioned which, which executives are yelling the loudest, um, wanting to look like we're doing productivity uh, when when maybe we're not. And, and all those things kind of conspire against us to make it to where it's harder to actually prioritize the return on investment. And it's also harder to have those discussions about what is actually priority. Okay, so now we've got this type of situation, $175,000 at the end of year one, where originally we had zero. So where did that $175,000 come from? How would you describe this? If, if you were trying to describe to uh, management or leadership or your peers why this is valuable, how would you describe where this, I mean, did it just, is it magic? You know, where, where did it come from? That's a significant amount of money. Considering we are only, the whole projects are supposed to make $400,000 a year, we've created not quite half of that just by changing the order we worked on things. So where did that $175,000 come from? Does anyone have any ideas? Focusing on finishing and working on a single project at a time, or iterative releases. If we cannot earn from things we finish, we might be building the wrong things. Okay, that's a great idea. That's that's a very good point. Um, if, if if we build all four things and get to the end, and it turns out we were wrong about something, we might not even learn that four earn that four hundred thousand dollars in the next year. Early delivery, delivering value per per release. So these are all good good aspects of this. The the one that I usually like to try to point out is that there was a cost related to the delay of when we got these projects. And we were delaying when we were able to start getting return on investment of the projects by the way that we were working on them because they were slowing each other down. When we work on one thing and complete it, we're able to actually remove some of that cost of delay. So that $175,000 represents the cost of delay that that occurred when we worked on everything at the same time that we're, we were able, that, that is waste, right? That $175,000 was waste that was in the system that we were able to remove by changing how we were working on things. It was waste caused by the, the cost of delay before we would actually start getting value from things. So by reordering the way we worked, we were able to remove some of that waste and capture it as a return on investment. Now this brings us to to the uh, kind of the 
the underlying thing in Agile that you'll hear people saying, you know, stop starting and start finishing. So finishing versus starting. We can get more value out of finishing work than we can get out of starting something new. And this is a, this finishing versus starting is a very important thing for leadership. If you're, if you're working with a team to try to help them either leading a team or working with managers and leadership of a team, these are the types of things that you want to get them thinking about. Because if they're not thinking about these things, they probably will not lead the team in a direction to take advantage of these, of these aspects of Agile that can make the team much more, more productive. So how do you do how how do managers and leaders lead? Well, one way is by asking good questions. And oftentimes what I found is that if you if you go into an organization and really listen to what managers and leadership, the questions they are asking people, you will find what's driving teams' behavior. If you listen to the questions that leadership is asking, you can usually fit, like if you watch how a team is behaving, say why are this behave why are they behaving this way? It's not necessarily the most productive way for them to work. Then you go and sit in and listen to what they're being asked by leadership and management. It usually becomes very very clear exactly why they are doing those those things. So questions that are good to ask are questions about agile principles. So for example, working software is the primary measure of progress. So think about that for for a second. If this is what we believe and we believe this is true. What is a question that a leader or manager should ask their team that would focus on working software? What's a question that you that a lead, leader or manager could ask the team that would help the team focus on working software? So when will the project be complete? That's a very common question. I hear that asked many, many times. Um, how many story points have you finished? Another very, very com common question. Or what have we deployed to production? And what I would like to suggest that is that what have we deployed to production of these three questions is probably the one most focused on working software. And, and let me explain why. Because if I go in, it, when I see leaders and managers go into a team and say, when will this project be complete? The action that that usually drives in the team is to start more work. When you ask somebody, when will the project be complete? They tend to start thinking in terms of how do I grab, how do I make this story just a little bit bigger? How do I maybe grab another story and bring into it? If I have some downtime, instead of trying to find somebody to help me finish something, I'm more likely to go out and grab another story to try to finish, to bring it in. So I'm not, so I'm staying busy. That's the type of behavior that you usually get when you're, when the focus question is always based on when will the project be complete? Um, how many story points have, have you finished? Uh, could be a better question, right? Because if that's encouraging them to break things up into small stories and actually deliver deliver it, that might not be a bad bad thing. But the question that gets the most focused on working software is what have we deployed to production? Because if we're keeping the team focused on how have what have we created that we've been able to take all the way through and finish? And then the next week, what have we added to what we've been able to take all the way through and finish? That keeps our focus on working software and delivering uh, working software. Um, somebody said, uh, let's say Tom said, of course, that assumes there are values associated with parts of the project instead of the, the whole thing. And, and that is a very good point, right? There's there are often there's often the perception that there's no piece of a project that can be delivered without the whole thing. My experience has been that that perception, if you really dig into it, you can find ways to deliver something that's valuable before you deliver de deliver everything. Um, but even if you're in one of the rare cases where you can't, the idea of being able to prove out the risk sooner of taking something all the way through is also something that's very, very valuable. Okay, so now there, so we're looking at principles and then saying what types of questions can leadership ask that will drive a focus on those principles in a way that will push behavior toward following Agile. So face-to-face -face conversation is the most efficient way to communicate. So what would indicate the team is prioritizing face-to-face -face communications? So what would indicate the team is prioritizing face-to-face -face communication? If you're looking at a team, what would indicate? Would it be that 
they all wear Mark's We Believe in Face-to-Face -face Communication shirts is because the daily stand-up is done with video on, or is because everyone has pictures of their coworkers to talk to. So you know the thing about talking to a rubber ducky, instead of that, you've got your coworkers. So if you want to talk to somebody, you just pull out the picture of Bob and have a conversation with Bob about it. Or everyone uses instant messaging. So the daily stand-up being done with video on is probably the best indication of the things listed here, that the team is prioritizing face-to-face -face communication. So whatever leadership can do to get the team focused on that type of communication, yes, meeting at the office, right, of actually being face-to-face. -face. I think I may have done this during the middle of COVID, so it was less of a uh, <laughs> less of an option at the time when I first wrote this, this question. Um, so, but anything management and leadership can do to get the team focused on how they are prioritizing face-to-face -face communication is going to help push the team forward and increase their agility. Okay, so another Agile principle, simplicity is essential. Well, what's a question we could ask to get focused on simplicity? Well, how about, what did we choose not to do this week? Now, that probably is not a question. Um, so I'll tell you what, if you've ever heard management or leadership ask, what did we choose not to do this week? Give a thumbs up. Um, as a positive question, if you've ever heard them, if you've never heard them ask that, do a thumbs down. So give me a thumbs up or thumbs down based on a, so most people have not heard, heard this. Okay, well, hey, we've seen a, a few people have actually heard management ask this. So that, that that's great. But this is a question that keeps us focused on simplicity. Um, it it gets back to the root of, are we actually prioritizing things well? Because if we're not asking this question or we're not choosing not to do things, then we can guarantee that we're not prioritizing well. Now, I see um, I see somebody here uh, saying that, unfortunately, it's not an option with distributed teams for uh, meeting and having face-to-face -face conversation. I have seen teams be very creative in ways of trying to do this. I've got somebody I work with uh, that's in a distributed and they are off by 12 hours and when we're when we need to meet with customer when we have customers that we're meeting with on a daily or weekly basis we find ways to to make it work because it's so valuable and it's so much more efficient than any other way of doing it um this says audio can be more beneficial than video video is not always solving what people think it's solving i think the question there is which this isn't to say that there's no place to use audio, but if we believe that face-to-face -face communication is the most efficient way to communicate, then that would probably want to tend us toward at least important communication, trying to make sure that it's being done where we can look each other in the eye in some, some capacity. Um, now, there's a lot of teams that just absolutely don't believe that, right? They say, we don't believe in that agile principle. We prefer just doing audio or we prefer instant messaging. And um, for, for teams that just don't believe that, you're probably not going to be able to convince them. They may not be convinced of any of the agile principles, right? Um, but, but my experience in working with teams that have really embraced trying to do their communication over video has been that it is... It, it, it has been very, very effective for the teams that have have em embraced it. Being in the same room together is even better, but sometimes that's just not going to be possible unless you can uproot the whole team and, and move them somewhere. I've, I've seen some teams, what they did is they, when they were forming early on, once a month, they would get together for a week, everybody be in the same room and work together. The rest of the time, they were working over a vir virtual team room. And that worked very well for them because they established the relationships that happen they establish the relationships that that occur when you're sitting side by side to someone and going out to lunch with them. And then they were able to carry over that relationship to when they're working with each other on, on video. Um, when, when you have people on video start commenting on the weather that each other are experiencing outside their window or what they're cooking for dinner, um, you, you've built something that's more than just a very formal relationship that can be very, uh, very powerful. Okay, next principle, highest priority is to satisfy the customer. Well, the question would probably be, are the customers smiling, right? Um, this is a, uh, if the customers are not smiling, then it is unlikely that we actually are satisfying the customer. So are the customers smiling? And if they are, then you're probably doing something right. From a leadership standpoint, how many, um, Okay, so thumbs up, thumbs down again, right? How many of you have ever had 
a leader or manager of an agile team ask something related to whether the customer was smiling or not? Like, have you ever ever smiling or, or happy in some way that that's a focus that they, that they are focusing on? So you've got some that have, some that haven't. From a leader, if you are leading an agile team, you should ask yourself, am I asking questions that keep the team focused on how happy are we making the customer? Um, because if you're not asking those types of questions, the team will probably take the other questions you're asking and make those the priority. And they may be very, very good questions. They may be headed in the wrong direction. Don't know. But whether the customer is happy or not is a very important indication of whether or not you're, you're following Agile. Okay, let's see here what we got. Okay, so where are we at? Oh, good. We, we made really good time. So I've got some uh, questions we're going to do here. Here's just a reminder of where we are. So today we're going through the Leading Agile Part 1. Next week, a chat GPT and TDD with Jason. And then uh, the week after that, we're going to be Leading Agile Part 2. And, and what we're going to get into in the next week is looking at um, how to measure progress in ways that uh, can help the team, as well as a lot of the ways we measure progress that, that hurt, the team, hurt the team. So got some more here. Let's go through and we will now do our competitive quiz. We've got eight questions and we'll talk through these as, as we go. And we will give away, let's see, what do we have? I think I've got t-shirts. Yes. Yes. We've still got t-shirts. Face-to-face -face communication sounds like a good thing to look at. So we will give away one of my turn your video on t-shirts here. So everybody go ahead and, and join. Give a few more seconds for anyone else to join. And I encourage you to go ahead and join. We'll put the link in there one more time. I encourage you to go ahead and, and join because you will remember more from the talk. Even if you disagree with something that I said, you'll remember a lot more from the talk if you're actually participating with, with this part of it too. And you may get a free t-shirt. So um, it's good all around. So let's give it a few. Oh, that's interesting how the, it shines through wherever it's green. Let's go. Cool. Okay, five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, answer fast to get more points. And the first question is, how did we make $175,000 magically appear? Was it because we used story points, delivered something small that could generate a return, worked weekends, or implemented safe? How did we make $175,000 magically appear? Two seconds. And yes, we delivered something small that could generate a return on our investment. Let's check out our leaderboard here. Who's got the top spot? Lots of right answers. And it looks like Frosty takes the top spot here. Very good. Next question. Kids are fast to get more points. Get ready. According to this talk, what is one way to identify satisfied customers? Is it because they create more backlog items, they write good reviews online, they smile more, or they go on vacation? According to this talk, what is one way to identify satisfied customers? Yes, they smile more. They may do some of the other things, but according to this talk, uh, we were talking about the fact that a satisfied customer is a customer that smiles. Okay, can Frosty retain the top spot? See, yes, Frosty still in the league. Follow lead, followed by KG, Hola Hop, Croc, Julie, Beyonce. Oh, we got Beyonce here. Cool, Chris, Jim, David, and Aloma, who is the fastest this time. Okay, next question. Speed matters. What does Agile say should be our primary measure of progress? What does Agile say should be our primary measure of progress? Is it cycle time, working code, story points, or velocity? What does Agile say should be our primary measure of progress? Two seconds remaining. And yes, it says working code should be our primary measure of, of progress. Now, keep in mind that does not mean that these other things aren't valuable at all. Right, cycle time can be very, very valuable. And the reason that cycle time can be very, very valuable is because oftentimes if you're measuring the right things, it may be a leading indicator of how rapidly you are producing the next iteration of, of code. Um, velocity 
can be useful as well. I find it often is less useful um, than, than cycle time. But these are all, these, these may be good things. But like we were talking about Percival looking at the veins in the back of his eyes, you've got to know what you're measuring. If you're measuring cycle time, because you know it's a good proxy for the working code and it gives you a leading indicator of when things are going awry, it can be very valuable. If you measure cycle time and it's not actually tied well, whatever cycle you're measuring isn't tied well to producing code, like you're measuring the cycle time of how long it takes to write code, but not the time to actually deliver the code all the way through to production, then it may no longer be a good proxy and it may mislead you. So working code is what we want to measure and how fast we can deliver working code. These other things may be very, very good to measure, but we've got to be very careful to make sure that we don't get misled by them somehow. Okay, leaderboard. And let's see, is Frosty still got the fastest finger? Yeah, it looks like it. Frosty's like really up to speed here. Followed by Hola Hop, KG, Julie, Jim, Chris, Greg, Stevio, The Hustler, and Aloma. Next question. Answer fast to get more points. What is one way to lead that was mentioned in this talk? What is one way to lead that was mentioned in this talk? Was it by creating competition, by asking good questions, by rewarding cowboy coders, or bringing donuts? What was one way to lead that was mentioned in this talk? And I am always a fan of leading by bringing donuts, but that was not mentioned in this talk. So yes, asking good questions. One of the most effective ways to lead is by asking good questions. And one of the reasons it's so effective um, and important is because managers and leaders are always going to be asking questions, right? And that, that's a good thing. They're, they're asking questions. But if the questions they're asking push people away from agility, it's not going to be valuable. And so often you see teams that are being driven by the questions that managers ask but major are asking questions that are pushing them to try to work in larger batches, um, work in larger batches and start more work and less focused on actually working in smaller batches and finishing work. Okay, leaderboard. Oh, hey, we got memes. Yes, is there anything they cannot do? <laughs> That's great. <coughs> okay, Frosty still was the fastest again. Frosty's like got probably the fastest internet connection and the fastest uh, fastest keyboard or, or something. We were doing some uh, mini meters with uh, like this, some competitive things with the team I was working with. And um, it was amazing. There was one, the youngest person on the team was like by far the fastest all the time. And I don't know if it was just a reaction time that the older ones of us didn't have, but it was just amazing how she would always be in the first place. So now I'm wondering what the age is of Frosty. You don't have to tell me, I'm just curious. Okay, next question. Answer fast to get more points. What question can drive simplicity? So if we want to drive simplicity, what is a question we can ask? How many stories did we start? What did we, did we choose not to do this week? How can we make sure we never have to modify this code? Or does this story bring you joy? What question can drive simplicity? And yes, what did we choose not to do this week? Because remember, if we're if we're asking that question, we are saying that it is important to be able to prioritize and it's important to be able to leave stuff out so we can focus on the things that are more important. Um, how many stories did we start this week is going to push us toward not completing work, but starting new work. How can we make sure we never have to modify this code? So that question, um, I haven't seen a lot of people actually asking that out loud but I've seen a lot of behavior that shows that's what people are most worried about. And when you get into a situation where everybody's just really, really worried about trying to not have to ever touch a piece of code again, it is very hard to deliver things iteratively because if you don't ever want to come back and modify something, that means that while you're working on it, it will just continue to grow and grow in scope to try to encompass anything you could possibly imagine instead of just the bare minimum that's necessary to deliver what you need today. Um, 
if the story doesn't spark joy, let it go. Backlog optimization. So y yes, that that is a point. If you um, if you've got a bunch of stories that no one wants, that's not good. But assuming that all your stories are things the customer is actually asking for, um, whether or not you happen to just feel really joyful about it might not be a good indication about whether it's uh, driving simplicity or not. Uh, but yes, it is good to make sure that you're working on things that will bring the customer joy. Remember, we want happy customers smiling. Okay, our leaderboard. And Hola, Hola Hop takes the top space. Um, moving to the top, followed by Julie, Jim, Frosty, Chris, KG, Stevio, Astrid, James, and The Hustler. Okay, six of eight, three questions. Six, seven, yes, three questions left. Answer fast. Remember, you're competing for a t-shirt here. Right? Turn your video on. We believe in face-to-face -face communication. We use Percival as an example of what? Measuring the wrong thing, not focusing on value, needing better glasses, or not following safe. What did we use Percival as an example of? And I'm asking this questions because then you'll remember it and you can pull it out and tell the story of Percival when, uh, when you get in one of these situations. So yes, he was measuring the wrong thing. Uh, he may or may not have been focusing on value, but the thing, uh, the point of the story that we were trying to emphasize was he thought he was measuring canals on Mars. He was actually measuring the veins in the back of his eyes. So he was looking at one thing and assuming it meant one thing, but it, it wasn't what he thought. So if we're looking at either our metrics and we think it means one thing, but it actually doesn't, we would be doing what Percival did. If we are a manager or leader and we're asking questions to try to motivate the team, but it's actually pushing them away from agility, we'd be doing something like what Percival did. Leaderboard, can Hola Hop retain the top spot there? And yes, Jim moves up to second place, followed by Chris, Julie, Astrid, Stevio, KG, The Hustler, Nick, and Greg. Okay, two questions less. Questions seven of eight. Answer fast, and I think this one... Oh, yes, what talk is coming up next? So what are we talking about? Agile lessons from Elmo and Big Bird, ChatGPT and TVD, Star Wars and the Agile Force, or Spock's Guide to Agile Delivery. What talk is coming up next week? And if any of those other talks sound exciting, tell me and maybe we can put one of those together. <laughs> like all the topics. Okay. So yes, ChatGPT and TDD. So I'm I'm looking forward to this talk. Jason does a lot of using, he's done a lot of experimenting with using ChatGPT to uh, as part of his development process. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see because he, he came here last year and talked about stuff. I think it's going to be very interesting to see how his process has developed. But when, if, if you weren't here last time when he spoke, he was showing where he's using ChatGPT to say, I want a test that does this, this, and this. And he would write a test. And then he'd look at it and decide whether it did what he thought he wanted. And then he would give the test back to him and say, okay, now write me code that makes this test pass. And it would give him some code. And then he'd run it and say, okay, no, it failed. The, that particular code failed because it didn't do this, this, and this. Try again. So he's having this conversation back and forth with ChatGPT to hone in on writing uh, software. So it's an interesting process. And I think it's probably a good thing for us all to be kind of aware of what's possible. Anyway, I'm looking forward to see an update of what he's found as he's done this for the past uh, six or seven months since we last talked to him. And let's see. Okay, I didn't do the leaderboard on that one. Okay, final question. In this one, I think all the answers are right. Um, none of them will dock you points, so you have to answer fast. There's one answer I would like you to answer, but um, all the answers count as correct. So answer fast to get more points. And the question is, I plan to invite a coworker or friend to one of the upcoming talks. What's your answer to that? Is it, yes, I will invite someone this week, or I already invited someone, or I'm keeping these secret a secret for myself, where Agile Lunch and Learns are your secret uh, superpower and you don't want to let anyone else know them. That's the answer I'm not looking for. But if you do choose that, it doesn't count as wrong for the purpose of this quiz. Okay, we got one person is keeping these secret for themselves. Most of us plan to invite somebody this week, and several of us have already. Okay, so our leaderboard. Let's see who's got the top spot here and wins the t-shirt. And it is... 
Hola Hop. Okay, so Hola Hop, uh, send me, you can send me a screenshot if you want showing that it's you or just send me an email, let me know. Uh, give me your address and your shirt size and we will get a shirt headed your way. I think I've still got all the t-shirts. Let me know what your size is. If I'm short on anything, we'll find a way to make it work. So send me a message. I would love to get that headed your way. And that covers what we want to talk about leading Agile today. Hope that was useful. Um, I will stick around for a while. If anybody needs to run that, that's great. But I'd love to hear your thoughts, questions, anything else, uh, any comments on uh, this talk or your experience with leading Agile.